How's everybody doing today? Everybody had a little bit of ice cream? Thank you. Oh, no problem. Yes. Uh, so, hi, uh, my name is Rana. Um, I have been very chatty with a lot of you this weekend, uh, but I'd like to introduce myself uh, again anyway. Um, I'm one of the organizers here at uh, Life Tell Space. Uh, thank you, Tim, for um, inviting me to join in organizing. Um, and I am also uh, the founder of the organization um, Yellow Punk that I am currently working on integrating Wagtail into. Um, so my background, actually, of past life, um, I was a journalist, so content is very important to me. Um, quality content management systems are very important to me. Um, I initially, when I, when I started working with content management systems, um, the first blog I ever had was on movable type. Um, and that was my very first uh, blog that was hosted on a server that was not on, say, LiveJournal or Zanga. Um, so, uh, but, so going back before movable type, um, the first website I ever built was actually to bring a community together. Um, I used to play a lot of uh, computer games. I was a big into RPGs, uh, and I played Baldur's Gate 2 uh, as a part of a gaming clan uh, that I uh, had put together. And uh, we needed a place where we could all hang out and build a community and share tips um, and talk about our characters. Um, mm -hmm. So I built a website that was iframes and uh, PHP VB forms. Um, it was message board. It was not really that elaborate. It was very hideous. Um, pretty sure there was a mouse trail in there somewhere. Um, but um, to me, uh, building a website means building a community. And I think that's really important. Um, and that's something I really see a lot of in, in Mocktail. Um, and that's why I think it's a, um, a great solution um, for uh, my website. Um, so fast forward to, um, to today. Um, we have built a community um, that was reacting to a, kind of a very negative um, um, sentiment last year. Um, well, it's been around, the negative sentiment has been around for a while, uh, but I, I, last year it was very amplified um, by the changing political climate, um, a negative sentiment against Middle Eastern North African individuals. Um, we decided we needed to create a space for individuals to gather um, and display the creative works that they've been working on um, and kind of shed a different light on um, a population that has been painted as, as violent um, and as scary. Um, it's a part of redefining the narrative in a way that makes sense to us um, and not someone defining it on our behalf. Um, I'm a huge believer in defining your own narrative because if you don't define your own narrative, someone else will define it for you. Um, so this is a way of, of um, making things right. Um, so if you have a, a community in real life um, that is you know, composed of people from, say, all over the country and some, um, some you know, um, different countries as well, it's very important to have um, a strong web presence, a voice for individuals to express themselves. Um, and that's where a strong CMS comes into play. Um, that's why we plan on having a very strong blog um, for individuals to um, do guest posts, to highlight people's works, um, to create a meeting place for people to learn about what everyone's working on, um, a place also to share um, opinions, um, and a place to share um, guides, um, um, solutions to different problems, um, a place to educate a community. Um, and that is why I think a CMS is so important to building a community. Um, nobody really wants to visit a website that is not really updated that often. Um, updates um, are what bring uh, users back. Um, and in our case, we don't really have users, we have community members. Obvious how to do it. Sorry. Laptop. Bam, bam, bam. You have a. Uh, does anyone have a display port to HDMI dongle handy? Yep. 
Yeah, that's HDMI. Oh, nice. Oh, this is USB-C. Yeah. Um, this might have USB. Yeah. It's USB. I think I've got a... Are you talking mini display port? Yeah, mini display port. Yeah, yeah. So 2015. I can go into that one if I have to, but... I've actually got another one. I've got, like, VGA on the other side of the world, so... Yeah, yeah, we'll be back in like, you know, this, this will be on there, which is on there. Yeah, hopefully. And these complaints about making it bigger? So it's just mirrored. So if I make this bigger. So if you look behind you, yeah, there you go. Perfect. How about that? All, All right, right, take it away. I'm, uh, this is the, uh, I'm 73 years old, but this is back to the third grade show and tell. <laughs> my um, my uh, talk is called Yearbook Show and Tell. Um, this is the website, www.fbyc.net. You might want to go to it because it's sort of part of my demo. I'm the volunteer website for this thing. It's got 300 family members, all in a Postgres member database. We have about 100 events per year. Each event needs its own web page. And each event has at least has event registration. So you have uh, people signing up to do the events. We've developed our website over the last 20 years. And last year, we finally converted the last bit away from the ZOAP. And we are now 100% on Django and been using Wagtail as our CMS for the last year. Like all yacht clubs, like all clubs, we publish a yearbook every year. In olden days, it was edited on Microsoft Word with about 10 different editors, myriad track change edits. Some pages, like the membership roster, were accessed database, database reports. We made a commitment a few years ago to get it all online. We now make changes online to the membership records. We add events to the database. We add Wagtail pages of each event, and event managers edit those web pages in Wagtail. So if you go to the website, this is the home page, and these are the stories that we post, and these are the events over here on the right-hand side. Um, so the event page is here. There are 100 events for, um, for 2018. Here are the event shares. This is where you sign up. To this, this, and then each event has its event page. And so if you click on opening day, here's the wagtail. This, the part on the, where all the words are is wagtail content. The thing at the top, the menu, and the thing at the left is all Django stuff. Um, we, we keep our yearbook. So, so at the end of the at the end of the year, once a year in January, we produce this thing. It's a 179-page book, and the the entire book is one wagtail web page. <laughs> this was the show and tell part. I thought might be interesting to you all. So the way it, the way it works is this this page here describes the details. I'm not going to take you through it, but the thing is taken into parts. Like the Donna does the offices and board page. Table of contents is done by her. I do the about the website and mobile app. The database does the yacht register view. The database does those things. And so you have pages in here like, um, let's see, I think I'm supposed to go here in that. So that's the schedule of events that's in the yearbook. And that's different than this page. This page has our events, but it's got links and it's got format doesn't work for a printed book. So this is a Django page. This is a page that ends up in the, year, in the yearbook. Same with this page here. This is the who's in charge of what event. So on this page, you've got the chairs, the names of the people in that fourth column that are in charge of the event. And this page here shows who they are, OK? So the whole yearbook is this page right here. 
So it starts out with the committee chairs. It starts out with the table of contents. Table of contents. Uh, who, who, name, phone numbers of people. Um, membership, membership roster. Yacht register. And finally, back here, we get to the events. Here's an event right there. And there's the, remember I showed you the list of the chairs. That's the chairs fit right in. So how does that work? And now I'm off my, on this thing. So on, on, on yearbook complete, if we go into our board only page, because we don't have this available to the public, we've got yearbook work. And the, this is the 2018 yearbook we're talking about. So here are the parts of the book. And if we, if we alphabetize this page right here, it will, it will, the, first, the second page, if you recall, was the table of contents. That's a book page. The phone numbers is a management page. The yacht register is a yacht register page. The membership roster is a membership page. Event list page, I showed you that. Chair list page, I showed offshore duty assignments. That's, that's, that's this page right here is, 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 a, um, is a page in the book. So in order, to, in order to show you how this works, I don't want to mess up my real thing. So I made a um, temporary one for, for us. And so if you go to the website over here where it says search in the top right hand corner, type in the word Philly, P-H-I-L-L-Y. Philly. P P H I L L Y. P H I L L. There it is. And so now, Wagtail Space page number one. That's the that's that I want that to be my page one of my yearbook. Okay. So I've already done the yearbook with about five pages right here and if we look at the if we look at the yearbook it looks like this here's and here's where's page one page one is right there it's in the wrong place okay so and it's also 2018 so if i go to um that would be this page right here. If I alphabetize right here, I don't know what, I don't know what the ordering of the child pages. So now page one's in the wrong place. So I can drag page one up here and put it at the front. And let's put the ch junior chairs in next because that's a chair list page and junior events. So now if I say this, oh, my mouse is in the wrong place. Well, I can't see the thing. I don't get off the screen. Minus, 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 minus. Yeah, I think it auto saves when you reorder. You think it does? Yeah. Plus, plus, plus. So now if I come over here and do this guy, page one is, is now first. Nice. Okay? And so you can do that if you have enough energy and time, dragging 80 or 100 pages around like that. And I, and, and I thought I would show you all the code since you've learned I know a lot about code. So if I come to this page, and if I add, I want to add a new page, add a new child page. And I want to hit take, this is, these are the kind of page sites we have, which I think are a very small kind of list compared to a big wagtail site. I don't know. I need a content page. I want, I want a book page. I want a book page, which... Which, which will be the um, code. And I want to choose, uh, it's, it's in the home, right here somewhere. Wagtail space code is this page. And so if I say publish there, then if I put this like that, code's gonna be at the bottom. So if I refresh, and let's change one more thing at this. While we add it, I want to put, um, I want to edit the, this page. How do I edit the yearbook? I'm going to edit right here. And I'm going to change the year to 2017. The yearbook page has a year capability. 
So now if I come over here, this was 2018. If I refresh it, it's good. the yearbook show and tells at the top, the junior chairs is, is 2017 now. The events are 2017. These things are all 2017 events. And there's the code at the bottom. And what I did was the models. Is that interesting to you all? Class, yearbook page? I don't know. Done by my Russian programmer. <laughs> Using Slack to talk to him on how to make it happen. So it's, it takes a while. Very cool. Okay. Okay. Whoa. What is this resolution? Um, okay. You I'm Bill Torquette. Uh, Say resolution. It's decoding to something crazy. Hang on. Let's kill that. Smart. And go to HDMI. I'm Bill Tork. What? I think it's the same. Get the full three resolution. It'll do. Get the, get the green button at yeah. the top point, left point. It's only point I got a setting that to put that green button. Yeah, but you want to go to the sessions and. Uh, yeah, yeah. The yeah. resolution's like adding for 600 or something. Go to the Apple commands. Yeah. Give it a. There we go. Is that a little better? Much better. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> so, I'm Bill Torcaso. I'm here from Boston. I work for Oxfam America. And I got the boot <laughs> in a bar fight. <laughs> okay, so Oxfam America is part of Oxfam, 19 country organizations. We're a anti-poverty humanitarian relief organization. We work in 90 countries. What you're looking at here is uh, based par partly on mezzanine and partly on a homegrown uh, CMS. We are converting to Wagtail. And this is my list of thoughts about Wagtail. Everything is going great. Wagtail is terrific. but. We're maybe four months into it, and these are the kind of problems I'm running into. So if anybody can solve them after you've heard the list, let me know. Uh, we're a small team, three and a half people, front-end engineer, myself, the back-end engineer, a web content specialist, which means somebody who understands that stuff I don't understand. And um, uh, the front-end engineer and I are working simultaneously on creating our stream blocks. And migrations are always a problem for us because we're always simultaneously editing in blocks.py. And we get migration conflicts all the time. And it's a real pain. If anybody knows how to solve this problem, let me know. Uh, we're also converting from our uh, commercial ISP into Amazon Web Services and Elastic Beanstalk. 
And I thought this was going to be, you know, the golden era because the use of rent itself and I wouldn't get any calls at 3 a.m. Uh, but it turns out it's very difficult to use without some expertise. Um, we need S3 buckets. We need RDS servers. We need Elastic Beanstalk instances. And if you use the wizards to create those things, then you get into a situation like this. I will be at home with my laptop, working normally, creating, say, an RDS instance, and it's great. It works fine. I come into the office the next morning, and it doesn't work. The reason is that the Amazon wizards always make very narrow security groups, and the ISP I use at home is different than the ISP I use in the office. And so without realizing it, I have locked myself out. So that's, uh, it took us a long time to sort through what those are. Um, we have lots of uh, assets. We have publications. We have a lot of photos from our teams in the field. We need to import them from our existing code base into Wagtail. I'm thinking of adding a UUID to each of our assets because trying to keep track of them by the primary key, which is correct in one system and not correct in another. Uh, so I'm thinking of putting on a universal identifier and just tracking all of our assets that way. Um, in working with the stream blocks, the stream field, I'm, I don't understand the rules about what you can and cannot do to access a value object. There's uh, on a page, you can declare something with an at property decorator, and it works great. You do that in a stream block class, and you declare a property decorator, and it's just not known. I understand that there's something about stream block struct value classes versus my class, but puzzling through that has taken a little bit of work. Um, we got some code from Torchbox to unify internal and external URLs. Um, we have a number of sites, five or six, and our search results, I mentioned this yesterday, have to go, have to include results across all of our sites. And so as our editors are creating new stories, new content, they need to be able to insert links that are either internal to a page chooser or external to a regular URL block. So we have this thing called a link block to unify the two of those. And it's working out pretty well, but there's difficulties about is it required or is it not required? And does that propagate out properly through nested, you know, when a link block is nested in a different struct block within our pages? Uh, again, I'm looking for answers to all of these problems. So. And lastly, we have a lot of content in WordPress. Uh, I was talking with uh, David about extracting from WordPress. I have a, it's a hard problem um, because the models don't match. But I worked on a data warehouse problem once where we use this technique, standard technique called extract, transform, and load. And my thought on WordPress is to write a fairly generic extractor that will write the, the fields into a Mongo database with a prefix that says this is a word perfect field. And then transform them in place, writing the new fields with a prefix of wag, wag underscore. So that transform is specific to the particular target. And then the load just travels through it knows to look for fields that are labeled by and pull them out into the right object classes. So these are the things that are challenges. Um, and that's pretty much all I have to say. Any questions? Thanks. Good luck. two subjects in. 
see if we can actually get this. Because I do talk fast, as you've probably all noticed. There we go. All right, so Dan and I have been working on a little something. As you've probably all done at some point in your life, you typed Wagtail Start and the project name. And then you've brought up your run server, and the first thing you have seen is a welcome to your Wagtail site in H1 without much, uh, without much else. Um, with also some help from our lovely people working on accessibility, we also picked out some colors, and we have done this. So if I do Wagtail Start WS, and, oh, you don't? Darn. There we go. Wagtail Start WS. It's created me a Wagtail project called WS. Success, WS has been created. I'm gonna go into the WS for Wagtail Sprint directory and uh, run my initial migrations. And then I'm gonna fire up my run server. But we're almost, uh, what we're almost done with after working on this, which I'm going to have to do localhost, is a new Wagtail start page. So, a couple things we still have to do here is uh, we want to dynamically figure out what version of Wagtail there is so we can point to the proper release notes for the current version, proper documentation, figure out what tutorial we actually want to point to. Uh, but there's also a link to the admin interface there. It reminds you to create a super user first, but we'll take you right into your Wagtail site interface. I did not build the uh, CSS components because that's a giant pain in the butt, but that's a topic for another lightning talk about how to be able to start developing without building, building the front end assets, which I think we wasted about 10 man hours in here on today. Oh, so right. I love you, Torchbox, but All we've got to come up with something better. All, All day long? Still the network. Got to be able to contribute without building the front end assets if you're not working on the front end. So that, that was a big takeaway from today as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, and I'll, I'll, I'll show this to you, is uh, so this is my GitHub. And you can see down here that I've been fairly active in the past year. And I was pretty active last year. And I was pretty active the year before that, but I was working a lot on a, a private repository site for Wharton. I, I still do work there, but I was working very intensely on a project that I couldn't um, contribute anything from work from. And then in 2015, I was pretty active. You can see here, this, this period right here is when I reopened my World of Warcraft account. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's sort of a hidden indicator of happened, but if you look here in May, you'll see that, you know, before that there weren't many contributions, and 2014 not much, and 2013 not much. So what happened here in May? I got sober. So I'm in recovery. Um, I'm an alcoholic addict in recovery. I've, uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I've spoken about it a lot um, over the years. I've been pretty open about it because, you know, I've got the one disease on the planet where I lie to myself and believe my own bullshit. So that's something I need to keep in check and being honest about it, rigorous honesty is a very important part to me. On my way here this morning on my bike ride, I went to a meeting. Um, you know, the cure for my disease is, it's not really that bad. I get to spend an hour, an hour a day hanging out with a bunch of my best friends talking about my favorite topic and my biggest problem, me. Uh, it's not the worst thing in the world, hanging out with another bunch of crazy people just like myself. And uh, as you've seen since coming into recovery, you know, GitHub graphs can show you a lot of things. But, uh, you know, I, I, I love how it outlines just how much more productive and how much more involved in our community I have been since getting sober. Because this is a big problem in IT and something that I think we need to be more open and honest about because there's a stigma around this disease like I've never seen before. If you think about if somebody um, is diagnosed with cancer, everybody rallies around them and immediately says, oh, yeah, you got this. And that, that's exactly how it should be. 
But for years and years and years with recovery, it gets swept under the rug. It's the dirty little secret of the family. It's, oh, this stays in our house. What happens in this house stays in this house. It's not something that's ever talked about. And I think it is something we have to talk about open and honestly, um, because recovery has been life changing for me. It's been absolutely wonderful. A lot of people here uh, in this room knew me before and after. And I think most would agree that uh, this version of Tim is, is a little bit better than, uh, <laughs> than the previous. Um, so how did this tie into Wagtail? It actually does. So while I was in rehab, that month before you saw that green period start, they gave us out these little printed booklets of local recovery meetings. And uh, my first thought was, you know, why the hell isn't there an app for this? Why isn't there an app for this? What millennial is ever going to look at this? And little did I know I was kind of sealing my own fate, because soon after getting out of rehab, I hooked up with the folks running the Philadelphia AA meeting site. They were just doing a redesign, and they figured out pretty quickly that I was an IT guy, and I immediately got roped in with one of my best friends now, Mike, into doing the regional Philly AA site. And we ended up meeting up with a guy in San Jose where we started Meeting Guide. Now, Meeting Guide is an Android and iPhone app that goes to a WordPress plugin that we developed um, for San Jose and Philly initially that actually does a pretty good job. So if I come to the current version of the WordPress site, you'll see if I come to meetings, there are 1,760 meetings a week in the Philadelphia area. So we, when we first launched Meeting Guide, it covered the Philadelphia area and San Jose. So if you take a look here, it's Friday. Here are all the meetings for today. If I switch this to any time, you know, I can come to evening and see what's coming up in the Philly area in the evening. All the same data that is in this WordPress site automatically feeds an API that goes to a central location that feeds the apps. So the apps update once a day from the actual data at the API endpoints. And we started with just Philadelphia and San Jose. In the year and a half since we've launched this, 150 other metropolitan areas have joined in. So we've got coverage across all of Europe. We've got, Hana, we've got Hawaii now. I love bringing up the Hawaii meeting list on the Meeting Guide app. And if you want to install the Meeting Guide app, even if you're not an alcoholic or an addict, it's a good thing to have on you because you never know when somebody's going to need to find a meeting. So right here, you'll see I can bring it up and it's going to look. It's Friday. It's right around me and it's going to show me all the meetings in the area. So what I've been doing um, since many people here come from a WordPress background and have seen the mess it turns into, this is our WordPress dashboard. So if you take a look here, this is what happens when you run WordPress. <laughs> This is what happens when you run WordPress. You have 17 I have no idea what the hell to do to update this website, and I helped write it. So if I come into, I don't know if it's under pages or posts or somewhere, but Divi's installed here, which is a whole different level of hell for me. I, I don't like slagging other technologies. It just doesn't work for me. So if I come here, I click on this, I think, and within here, I click the use the Divi Builder something. It <laughs> freezes the browser. Use the Visual Builder maybe, but you, you get the point. If I can't figure this out, how the heck are the uh, non-technically inclined people, volunteers in the local in a group office gonna be able to get anything done? I'm still waiting for this editor. This is a decent machine on a high-speed internet connection. Okay, there we go. Um, I think I can do something here, sort of. Okay, good, I have a cursor. I can do something here. But as you can see, this is, um, this is not an ideal way uh, to maintain a site. So I decided it was time to bring Wagtail into the house to improve the experience of the people in the office. Because right now, we also have all the meetings in the Philadelphia area in an access database that I have a daily cron job that pulls, they go from access to MySQL, I pull them in from MySQL, process them into the right format and insert them directly into the WordPress database. This is not a good situation to be in. So I've started a Wagtail app, which is gonna be pip installable and open source for any recovery group that wants to move over to Wagtail and Django that performs the same API service and meeting listing that the WordPress plugin is. So we'll have a choice. And uh, I've gotten the beta of that up here which is a little bit cleaner. So you can see I've only got a couple of the meetings imported now for testing, um, but it's basically got the equivalent of a Google search. Thank you to David Tables here. So you can search for any field. So if I put in a, a zip code 
if I could type, you'll see that comes up. If I put in Mill Road, you'll see that result comes up. If I put in uh, Bucks for Bucks County, you'll see all the ones in Bucks County come up. If I want to find open meetings, I can put in open. If I want to find closed meetings, I can put in closed. I can put in Sunday. Um, I can put in Monday. There are none there because it's only Sundays. Wheelchair for accessibility. So you'll see this gives a pretty powerful search for people right on the front page. We are working on making it fully responsive. It's not quite yet there with the data tables. Um, but the big advantage here is you saw that dashboard. Here's the Wagtail dashboard equivalent. So what this gives our office now is, an, is a very straightforward interface to use. So if you come to Pages, you can either go to the content of the site or look at the locations that we've imported. So if you look at locations, it'll show you the locations and then you can drill down to meetings. So I've actually imported all the meetings, but when I'm working um, on that first interface we saw, I've only got 10 results being returned, so it's super quick while I'm working on the responsive tables of the interface. Um, the search is also implemented. So if I search for, uh, let's look at Rittenhouse. So there's uh, Holy Trinity, Church of the Holy Trinity, 1904 Walnut. That's the one right on Rittenhouse Square at the corner of 19th and Walnut. You'll see here that that is actually a location page that we've built. If we drill down, you can see all the meetings at the location. So Sunrise Semester meets a couple times a week. That's how many recovery meetings there are a week at 19th and Walnut. So if we go into Sunrise Semester, you'll see that we've actually got, you can say what group it's affiliated with, the day of the week, the start time, the end time, and what type of meeting it is. And uh, if you ever want to check out a different kind of AA meeting, oh, I don't have it imported yet, but I have a secular Sunday meeting called Progressive Not Perfection, where we actually alternate chairs between men and women every other month, and within our group conscience say that people who do not adhere to binary gender can chair any month they want. We do things a little differently than a lot of the more traditional AA meetings and follow a completely secular format. So it's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun to put together and uh, it's a challenging project, but you know, this kind of thing is really, I, I do feel it is saving lives um, because you know, what millennial is ever gonna look at one of those printed out books? So before I finish, I'll just give you a quick look, thanks to Ryan at the actual meeting guide here. Let's see if this works. Hooray! So this is the actual meeting guide at that gets fed with either the WordPress or the Wagtail data. So if I flip my current location over to Hawaii, let's all get really jealous and uh, see what's going on in Hawaii. You'll see, oh, here we are in Hawaii. And uh, it's always kind of fun when I'm travel to actually use an app that I've written. <laughs> so you'll, you'll see in here, uh, where have I been recently? I haven't been to Hawaii, but checking out meetings in Vermont, Miami. So if we go up to Vermont, you'll see Oh, gee, location not participating. But it gives you all the information on how to get in touch with that intergroup, their website, and slowly but surely we've been trying to get more and more locations in. So like I said, we're up over 150 now um, across the world. We have all of Europe. Friends of mine were going to India and we checked it out. There are actually four cities in India that are now in. So it's been a, a pretty re rewarding project to be a part of. So uh, thanks a lot for giving me a couple minutes, and uh, I hope this showed you a little something, uh, something interesting today in another way that Wagtail is helping to do good. Thanks. Swift and Android guys. Okay. He actually went native. Uh, next up was Pat. Wagtail 2.0 upgrade. Is this gear going well or really bad? <laughs> <laughs> I'm rooting for well, but I'm curious. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Something actually worked. All right.
Let me make my viewer a little bit bigger. Is this, is this on? Can folks hear me? Okay, cool. Um, so my name is Pat and I work with the Federal Election Commission. Um, so that is a government agency. Uh, we have nothing really to do with elections. Uh, elections used to be part of us. The whole voting part used to be part of us a while ago and then that sort of like split off. Uh, so we basically do campaign finance uh, data and uh, disclosure um, and then also enforce campaign finance. So if you're interested in looking for like uh, how much federal candidates raised, um, things like that, you can search that through our website. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little tour real quick. Uh, if you go to our site, fec.gov, and then just go to uh, campaign finance data, explore all data, you'll see a bunch of things like you can look up um, committees um, or candidates. Um, and there's a little auto suggest that comes up and you can go direct to their page um, and see all this stuff. Uh, so if you're interested, um, you can come check us out. You can also look up individual contributors. So I like to say, you know, if you're interested in looking for like a celebrity like George Clooney or somebody uh, who has contributed, you could do that uh, via our website as well. Um, and then also, we're always continually trying to like improve our site. Um, so this is a new feature that we implemented is our little feedback drawer. So if you're interested in signing up, uh, for helping us do user testing for our site. Uh, we would really appreciate it. We're always looking for people, um, especially people who don't know anything about us, to sort of test us out um, and, and uh, see how things go. And um, we're also remote, too. So like, um, <coughs> excuse me, I have a little cold. Um, we're also remote, too. So like, you can, um, we can do things through Google Hangouts or video screen share uh, for those user tests as well. Great. Um, so the whole upgrade portion, um, I was looking at the Wagtail website, and right now, like the upgrade portion of the docs is really within the um, release notes, um, and it's kind of scattered, right? Like you have your, you have the Wagtail uh, upgrade, uh, upgrading Wagtail like release notes, which gives you a good sort of like uh, list of all the versions and the deprecation policy and the upgrade process and things like that, but it kind of skips some stuff that they also include in like other release notes. So if you look at like version 2.0, um, you'll notice like some other um, release notes and things like that. So basically, like during the sprint, I was trying to consolidate everything into like one like stream, streamlined web page that would tell you like what are the steps that you might go through to try to upgrade uh, your Wagtail uh, to Wagtail 2.0. Um, so I put in a pull request. Um, my pull request was right here to the Wagtail site. Um, I, I did a fork off of uh, Will's um, branch there. Um, and I was also working with Michael too. Um, and created this pull request. And essentially, um, this is the new uh, page that I came up with. It's just a new like upgrade page, um, which has most of the same things uh, that were in those release notes. But I tried to sort of keep them in one spot um, a little bit more streamlined. Um, let me make that bigger, if you will. Um, so we have like the upgrade requirements up at the top, um, then the upgrade process, and you can sort of like read through the upgrade process and what you can do to upgrade. Um, also, I put up here to a Wagtail mm -hmm. 2.0 note that if you're upgrading to Wagtail 2.0, there is an update script which I did not know about when I initially tried to upgrade. And I'm literally in Sublime writing regex to see how I can you know, change all the module names, um, which was really annoying. And then I found this update script after the fact. Um, but the good thing is that the update script actually works, um, because after I ran all my regex, um, I wiped that all away and then ran this, and it worked great. So um, let's see what else. Uh, uh, this this section is kind of new. This is the upgrading directly to Wagtail 2. Um, so the docs kind of say like you should try to upgrade version by version, um, which is a good idea. You should still try to do that locally to make sure you can do version by version. There's no like weird errors or things in your application that might pop up. Um, but if you wanted to upgrade directly to Wagtail 2, it's 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 not as painful. Um, and I tried to like document it so um, you all can sort of get an idea. And I'm actually going to try that to do that here locally um, by following these uh, locally upgrade environment steps here. So who here uh, has squashed their migrations? 
you all are the good people. You all have squashed your migrations. We have not. Um, and that's when you end up with something that looks like this. We've got 101 migrations, and we found it very difficult. Like, we tried to squash a bunch of times. We're not able to successfully. So that's where you kind of end up with just this big slew of migrations, which uh, kind of blocked us in our upgrading a little bit. And we had a little bit of a workaround to try to, to fix that, uh, especially when you're running tests. Like, um, the tests start from a blank database. You're just trying to run the migrations from a blank database. And if those dependencies aren't actually there, it's going to error out. Um, so I'll let you know how we sort of went through that hurdle. Um, so first up here, it says upgrade version of Wagtail uh, to v2. So that is already in our requirements file. Uh, I might have checked out a new version, so it might not be. So I'm going to go to my requirements, and I'm going to upgrade us to version 2. Uh, and I'm just going to do 2.0.1. Um, that's just one of the patch versions that, that's there. And then I'm going to go ahead and do a pip install. Oh, i got to be in my pod environment first. And I use a pym for my Python environment. OK, so that's going to go through all of my requirements, run through everything. Oh, you know what? I forgot. I got to upgrade Django too. Um, these are not compatible versions of Django. Um, I think it was 1.11.13. Let me install it again. So now if I do a pip freeze, that'll tell me what I have installed so far. So I've got my Wagtail 2 installed, and then I've got um, Django 1.11.13. Uh, so I've upgraded. Uh, I neglected to say that within the documentation that you should also update your Django 2 uh, to the version that is compatible. Um, and then uh, this uh, upgrade, or sorry, Wagtail update module paths, you can just run that uh, against your repo. And that will go ahead and update all of your module paths, uh, which is super helpful. So that just updated um, all of those migrations, which you, know, you don't have to do by hand. And then after that, um, you can run your migrations against your database. Oh, I got to be inside of FEC. OK, so this, this basically upgrades all of the Wagtail application um, migrations, uh, which is great for like your, your database has already uh, migrated all of your home applications. So you don't have to do it again. Um, this migration is just for the updated 2.0 sort of migrations uh, that just ran. But you'll see the failure in the test. And if you run tests inside of your deployment, um, your test uh, will probably fail, which um, mine did. So if I try to run the test, you'll notice that it will fail any minute. Yeah, there. So it's complaining about this, like, you're looking at this and you're like, what is going on? And it's like complaining about this Wagtail core page draft title thing. Um, so a weird workaround that I did for that was I actually looked in my migrations and stuck that dependency within the um, initial migration. Uh, I don't know if that's like the way to go, but that's the way that I did it to sort of get around the hurdle of the test. So essentially to do that, you do manage.py show migrations to see what kind of migrations that you have. Um, and I'm looking for Wagtail core, because that's what it bombed on, Wagtail core here. And then I'm looking for the migration that it bombed on, which is this draft title thing. So if I go back into my migrations, which are right here, and I go to my initial, so I'll go ahead and run it first, I replace this dependency with the one that it failed on. 
and then run my uh, update or my test again. Um, and that actually passes the test. Um, or it should pass the test. OK, so that ran all my tests. It completed just fine. So um, the issue that we were having is we could deploy it just fine if I disable the tests. But you kind of want your test to pass before you deploy it, right? So in order to um, sort of deploy it, um, I, I, I put this into the, oops, into the documentation here that for deployment, you should, what I think you should do is you should create one branch that disables your tests. Um, the, at least the migration portion of your test. And then basically um, go ahead and deploy it so it can run all of your migrations uh, into your database. And then after that, create another branch that re-enables the test again, and then deploy that. Uh, all of your tests will pass. You'll never have to do this again unless Ytil has another breaking change, uh, which changes a bunch of the app names. Um, so like that's essentially what we had to go through to like upgrade. Um, it was really painful trying to figure it out because there are so many dependencies upon dependencies. Um, but hopefully like documenting it here sort of like shows you all that it's possible um, if you come through you know, those issues. I don't know if you all have come through those issues uh, trying to upgrade yourselves, but yeah, I was hoping that would help. Are there uh, any questions? Nope. Yes. Yes, we did. Um, actually, Ytil 2.0 comes with Draft um, Drafttail, um, and Drafttail is actually pretty awesome. I have it here on my. Uh, this is our feature site, um, and it has the upgraded version on here. And the cool thing about it is it has these nifty like concepts of folders now, um, which you know a parent page essentially is a folder. You've got the whole edit pencil right next to it, which is really nice. Um, you can go to each of the pages uh, pretty easily and sort of go through things. Um, if you look at, let me go to an actual content page. Uh, so if I edit this page here, and I chose one with an HTML block, sorry about that. Um, let me find one without an HTML block. Maybe this one. Oh, you know what? Um, I think I think something happened to our configuration where it updated itself. Let me try it. Let me try one more thing. Sorry, am I taking up too much time? Am I taking up too much time? No. Um, let me try. Let me try something real quick. Uh, let me try going to my local admin and see if that actually has it in there. If it doesn't, then. Um, let me try to add something. Nope, sorry, that portion is complete, uh, completely broken right now because I built this from uh, from the beginning. But yeah, the the Draft.js is actually really nice, but it's really complicated to code anything in. Um, I'm a, a real beginner at React, and I had to take Wagtail's example of their stock example uh, to create a new glossary item um, for the FEC. And that was like modifying four files, <laughs> Python code, React code, all of that to create a simple functionality of like putting in a class and a data term and sticking that onto the page. So um, yeah, I was the one that was advocating for the whole edit HTML thing. I know it's kind of taboo, but like it just makes life so much easier. Like if you didn't have to actually create new tools within the editor for your you know, content folks to be able to do. Like, it's just that much more easier. So, yeah. But anyways, um, yeah, that's it. Next up, Will.
I can work with this. Um, I don't have a whole lot, uh, certainly not any massive demos, but I wanted to show a couple of things. First of all, um, with the documentation uh, sprinting project, uh, Pat did her upgrading document, and I took what Lacey talked about yesterday, and wouldn't it be great if like programmatic manipulation of pages and revisions was documented, and tried to do that. Um, I didn't hit all of the things that she talked about and posted here, because at least the way I'm organizing them in my mind for the specific story that she is telling, it makes sense. For the way I think about it, it doesn't, so that might be, please comment on the pull request if you think that it's crazy the way that it's organized. But what I tried to do is um, go through kind of the process of creating new pages, uh, st starting with the fact that we have to manipulate both pages and page revisions if we're going to do anything programmatically. Um, using the blog example, more or less exactly what she talked about, the bit that she talked about, you know, if you need to backdate as you're importing old content and needing to save revisions before you save the page. Um, it also got me thinking about something that I know we have occasionally struggled with. We have a reasonably, a reasonable number of page types in Wagtail at CFPB, and we occasionally get the schema wrong, and or it's not quite what what we originally want isn't quite what we want when content editors actually start entering content. So we have to change our page model schemas. So doing that is interesting if you have a lot of pages that might have draft revisions or old revisions that someone might want to go back and look at, pull into something. So I also wrote a bit here about if you're migrating pages and revisions. If you're doing, like, you can do a schema migration, and that's great. If you need to get to the point where you're doing a Django data migration on pages, it's helpful to know that you should, I'm sure, who's done a data migration on Wagtail pages before? Have you migrated, have you modified revisions at the same time? Uh, yeah, it's like you, yeah, yeah. So you don't have to. Uh, like, there's nothing that will cause an immediate error if you don't. But if someone has like draft pages that are, like, you can get into a weird state where there are revisions that don't match your new schema, especially if you're changing things massively. So I've tried to document here the fact that you will need to modify the revisions. And the way that we do that is to load the revision.content.json, modify the field, and then dump it back to JSON and save it. And then kind of how to do that in your data migration. Um, and there are typos aplenty and grammatical errors and everything else like this that Andy has already uh, spotted for me that I will be fixing. But this is a pull request on uh, on Wagtail for that. I also briefly wanted to show off something else that we've created at CFPB uh, that we created kind of after Andy started putting his talk through our approval process, uh, which is Wagtail Tree Model Admin. So who's created model admin, uh, Wagtail model admin interfaces for Django models? Anybody? So it's great, because you can expose things that aren't CMS shaped in the same interface for content editors or whoever needs to edit them, um, which we've done a few times now for, again, content that's not really CMS shaped that you might want to tie into Wagtail pages and that sort of thing. We encountered a need for doing that with content that is very hierarchical. So we have a model that is clearly a parent of another model, which is clearly a parent of another model and so on. It, it actually goes down four levels. And I don't have a demo of this, and I don't, I probably shouldn't show the thing we're working on, 
but it's open source. You can check out CFW Refresh, and it's regulations 3K under there if you're curious. But basically, what Tree Model Admin does is it uses Model Admin to I'll show a GIF because that seemed to be the best way to explain it to create that relationship. So these are the in one of the wagtail test cases, the fixtures are uh, authors and books. So this is reusing that. And it basically, demo might be easier. Um, again, I don't, this is the unit test. This is the tox environment that I am in right now, and hopefully it works. Or not. Oh, it might have been. You're right. Yeah. right no, we're still. All right. Well, let's try this. Is it like because it's responsive because of the resolution? Maybe it's like a bug. It it could be actually. I don't know. It's this is. I mean, this shows you what is responsive and isn't. Um, <laughs> but so you can't tell from here. So this is your normal model admin URL, and if I want to look at J.R.R. Tolkien's books. I can click on the same kind of tree navigation UI that you have in the Wagtail Page Explorer. I have breadcrumb navigation back to the parent, but this is all using just filters on the model admin um, URL structure that it already has. So basically, I can look at books just like you just like if you go like if you register the model admin and you can go to that and then books and you see the full list of books but then you could also fil filter by author um, which model admin also gives you uh, if anyone explores the documentation but long story short this is I think a neat little library for things where if you need it if you have models that are shaped like that then this is something that will be really nice. And if you're not sure if it helps, it won't at all. So that's it. So just, just get started. Yeah, you introduce, yeah. introduce okay. yourself. Okay, great. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Erin Malini. I've been a developer for 15 years. Um, I work for myself as a consultant. My current clients include Cactus Group, if you're familiar with them, um, and also Wharton Computing. Um, I know Danielle through the tech community, but today was our first opportunity to work together, and it was really fun. Um, my first Django project was in 2015. I was learning Django and Wagtail at the same time. Um, so anyway, it, it was really awesome because uh, I ran into an issue and uh, reached out on Twitter and the Wagtail handle, which was actually Tom at the time, like commented back to me and really helped me out. It really like um, helped me to join the Django community and the Wagtail community and I just, I really loved it. It was a really great experience. I bet there are other experiences in here um, similar to that one. So today I got to work with Danielle. Um, I was excited because for me deployments can be really painful. And so after seeing his talk yesterday, I wanted to learn more about how to use Divio's control panel. Um, so I got to do that today. So it was really fun. I think you had enough from me yesterday, so I won't repeat it. <laughs> uh, I'm Daniela, so you probably recognize me or you haven't forgotten me by now. Um, and this was uh, really nice because, um, as I said, I, 
been a, a kind of champion for Wagtail um, at DPO. And uh, now we've got another, a member of the community actually who's been working on some really interesting stuff that's going to benefit anybody who wants to use. Well, it's actually going to benefit anybody who uses the demo as well, isn't it? So it's going to benefit anybody who uses Wagtail. So I think we should just show what yeah. we're going to show. Yeah, so, okay, um, great. And, um, so, so I'm on the dashboard here, or I'm on the, the Divio control page. Um, and I'm going to dive into a project that we have here. And so this is a Divio project that we have built. Um, and I, I want to see what it looks like live, so I'm going to click there. And this is the Wagtail Bakery demo, so we just spun this up really quickly, actually. When we found out we still had a half an hour to do our lightning talk, we were able to spin this up. I'm going to go to the admin, and do you notice anything maybe not quite right here? What's wrong with this project? It's on Wagtail 2. Yes. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's always on Wagtail 2. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, my next step is going to be... Um, your next step is going to be... I think I'm um, going to run it locally, right? Well, why don't you go to the add-ons on the control panel to update this one? Okay. Yeah. So, I'm in the control panel. I'm in my Wagtail Space Baker US project here. And I'm going to go through and update these add-ons so that I get up to the correct updated version of Wagtail. So I'm going to start with that add-on. So I went to my project, I went into add-ons, and if it wasn't selected, I would select installed so that I could drill down into the add-ons that are currently part of this project. And I'm going to go ahead and configure the Wagtail add-on. Um, and as you can see, it's um, we're using the same version here as Wagtail 2.0.0, so we want to update that and change the version. Um, you'll see 2.1 is actually not listed here. It's still in beta, but that's okay. We'll still use it. I'm going to update it. Yeah. Update. Okay. And then it brought me back to my add-on screen, and I'm going to drill back down into installed. Um, we also need to update our version of Django, so I'm going to go ahead and do that too. Change version. Beta. Let's go right on to 2.0. Update. Well, Erin's doing the next part. She's got two more. Um, she's got the Aldrin add-ons application and the Aldrin SSO. Um, I should explain the name Aldrin. It was just the old name for um, uh, Divio Cloud. And just don't make the mistake of make, giving something a name that you might ever change because it will live on in your code base forever. <laughs> um, so Aldrin add-ons is the framework that makes all of this uh, possible. And uh, Aldrin SSO is, is our single sign-on system that makes it possible for people to log in with a click so once they're logged in. Everything yes. Yeah. Okay. So, Erin has to update those other ones as well, in order to be themselves compatible with Django two. Right. Okay. Do you match the version numbers there? The the, the add-on version number. With at the moment, we don't actually have a very nice way of um, keeping those things in synchronization, and we would like to do that, but not necessarily through version numbers, but it's, it's a bit fiddly at the moment, yeah. Okay, so now that we have all our add-ons updated, we can go ahead and deploy. Do you want to share our... the commits that you've just sure. created? Sure, the, um, the commits, oh, in here. Yes. Yes, yes. So. Actually, let me slow that down a bit. So I went into my dashboard, and you can see my test server now has some updates. It says four commits not deployed yet, because we haven't deployed these. So if I click show, it just shows them here in um, reverse order. So got all of these versions updated here. I got all four of them. This is a nice reminder that I remembered to do all four. And then I'm going to hit deploy. And this is actually really, really fast. Um. Yeah, starting. We didn't set up the project locally, though, did we? No. No, we forgot. No, we mind. didn't. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So.
So this is now actually rebuilding the container on the life site for the, uh, the project. So it's actually applying those upgrades on the test server. Uh, maybe this would I be can, a good moment to switch to the local development local, and, yeah. and do it then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got set up today to do this, and it's actually pretty simple to pull down this code locally. If you go into your local development, second command there, Divio project setup, and then the name of your project there. So I can go ahead and paste that command, set up my project. And this takes a little time. It's got to download all the um, Docker layers and, and then and then build them. So we can leave this running. But probably the other one that we were looking at, um, oh, this was it was quite quick. But oh, it was just getting started there. So the other one um, in the dashboard should have should be. Um, Did I go away from it while it was running? Oh, there, there it is. Okay. Yeah. Good. Looks like it was successful. All commits have been deployed. So now if we go back and look at the site and go to the admin, we no longer get that warning message because we've updated, which is great. Um, when, when Erin says we've updated it, do you want to go to GitHub? Oh, and show sure. Yeah, so it was actually Erin yeah. who updated so, it. So, so there was one, there was one, um, add-on that actually had it had to be updated today the others were already all up to date but the this is the aldrin wagtail add-on um, this one had some incompatibilities with django 2.0 so that's this uh settings oh yeah text larger for sure um it had some incompatibilities with django 2.0 so um we sort of worked through those and uh updated those it's that middleware line there and also this line here. So once I updated these two lines, it was then compatible with um, Django 2.0, and then I also updated the version of Wagtail in here. So um, this uh, add-on, Aldrin Wagtail, it's, it's just a kind of wrapper that itself installs the appropriate version of Wagtail or, or whatever software you want. So Erin's work, if you scroll up, was to do things like, um, if you go further, I think the most interesting, that's, okay, so this part here, this is where the add-on knows that this middleware needs to be in a, in a, a wagtail project, so it will uh, extend the settings, so it will auto-configure. It was reasonably easy to do. It was, it was, um, yeah. the error messages were, pretty much told us what we needed to fix. Yeah. Um, and so that was a big step going up to Django 2.0 compatibility, but for the next edition of Wagtail, which will be 2.0.2 or something, you'll probably just have to update the changelog and... The, and the version. Um, yeah, and the version, and, 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 that will, and that will be it. Well, all of our lovely public ones. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, and yes, it will. And, and also... If you go to the anonymous demo now, so the, the, the demo, okay, the anonymous sure. demo sh I showed yesterday, the one that launches instantly, um, that will also be updated to Wagtail um, 2.0, no, sorry, 2.1.0, yeah. Um, once all the demos that are, are in the pool have been recycled. So I think the ones right now might still be on, on, on this version, but soon it's, everyone's going to have a, um, there you are, so they'll do that and they'll be on the very latest version of Wagtail. So I, I think Erin is going to be the uh, uh, Wagtail's ambassador on DVO Cloud or something like that. So I'm excited thank you that. very much, Erin. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. That, that was all we wanted to show, wasn't it? Unless you wanted yeah. to show something about the uh, local the build. Locals, but that you, the local build is done. I could. Yeah, was there something that you. I mean, we could run it, but that's about it. That's, yeah, we would, um, yeah. yeah, I think we should yeah. show everything. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have uh, Michael.
find somewhere, but we can hang out outside. Yeah, I'll be very quick. <laughs> So, some of you might remember from my talk yesterday that we had to write this, I don't know how to make that bigger, sorry, but we had to write this squirrely code to kind of get image URLs to work in our API, and then um, we do this weird thing where we add like a property, and that's how we get the, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to do that with, the, with this particular thing. I'm guessing that doesn't work. Um, I can zoom in on the web portion of my demo though. But basically just there's a there's some wonky code that that I was trying to fix and I was going to actually document how to do that when I was working with Pat and Will. But then I was like why am I not just fixing this uh, problem? So I put a PR up that there's now a download URL in the image API. So this works whether, so this is my uh, my actual website for work and we're using CloudFront so it works like that and then I set up a brand new site that's not using AWS and that returns the media path properly as well. So yeah and there it is in like a context of a page and there's the PF PR up. Uh, oh, and I did, yes, thank you, Tom. I did uh, actually do a little documentation updating as well. I, I put in that this now is part of that. <laughs> um, yeah, that's all. Is there a hook up on here for a MacBook Air? Or? Um, Tim, I need your adapter. It's an Air, not a Pro. Okay. Uh, USB C or VGA? Uh, VGA, or, yeah, VGA, yeah. All my HDMI. So um, I'm here from the folks who are working on the accessibility piece of things today at the Sprint. Um, my name is Mataki Reed. I'm from the CFPB, like several other people who are here today. I think we've got a squad of five people here. Um, we've all been working really hard at our government agency on accessibility and trying to improve our pages, our sites, our products on it. And so some of us came here and said, hey, we see that there's a tag on the Wagtail repo about it. We hear that they're going to be looking at accessibility things. Let's see if we can try and see if we can contribute back to Wagtail about that. So um, we have here the issues that were already up on the site about that, on GitHub about that, including one particular one that I started looking at. I know a few of the other folks started looking at other things as well. But this one was about color combinations in the admin not validating against WCAG AA. Um, for folks who don't know that, this is talking about the web content accessibility guidelines that are supposed to be basic and being used across the entire industry internationally in order to comply with um, how people use the site. It doesn't matter if they're blind, if they're low vision, if they're hearing impaired, if they have dyslexia, if they are epileptic, all of those components are all, all get built into these guidelines that are here in order to try and make the web more usable for people, no matter sort of where they stand. Um, it's also something that comes up um, for us as a government agency, because it's something that we try to adhere to. It's also part of something called Section 508 guidelines. I think the woman from Columbia mentioned yesterday that we are legally required in order to adhere to. So 
There's a bunch of things that are going on in here where there's color combinations not validating. Things like the white text on teal is less readable to the point that it might be unreadable for some people. So there's certain rules around the like contrast ratios that we can go ahead and put in place to make sure that things are more useful for people across the board. Um, and so that's one of the things I wanted to look at. There's a lot of things in this issue. I figured that I can just tackle a few basic things to start with. Um, so here is my copy of the admin. The resolution is really off on this right now. I wish I could fix it. Um, where this is the way that the admin is basically when you go ahead and set up your new site right now. We'll blag them Wattail 2.0. Um, and it's pretty hard to read. Even if it was at a normal resolution, it was kind of hard for me to see the white on the teal that's there. And it's that sort of wagtail teal. Is there? I've already done that. I'm a, uh, you want to do it some more? Oh, okay, let me do it on the, I'll do it on every tab, every time I get to a new tab. Okay, um, so this is kind of like the default that I have on there. It's hard to read the white on the teal. It's hard to also re read the teal on sort of that like light gray by like panel place that's here. Um, and I went through one of the things that we've used to the CFPB as we've gone through and started like really auditing our sites for accessibility is a web extension called Wave, and bear with me while I make it big enough for you to read it. Um, it's basically a web extension that you can run in either Chrome or Firefox on any web page you have, whether it's something that's out in production somewhere or if it's on your local host, on your own computer. So you can check things before you actually push them out to check and see how compliant it is um, for these general guidelines. Um, and here's the example of just where it is on the Chrome site. You just go ahead, you add it to Chrome, and then you have it in your browser. And so if I go back to the dashboard and I have this extension here and I click on it and open it, it says right now based on my dashboard that I have here where I have four pages basically that I have one error on the page, so straight up error saying that you're failing, failing across. And there's also 19 contrast errors. And right now, for the purposes of this, I'm really interested in the contrast errors. So I'm going to go to the contrast tab and start clicking around to see some of the things they have there. They have things in the sidebar and the side panel. Um, and then they have stuff here, like up here, the welcome to my site, Wagtail CMS, the white on the teal. Yep, it's not accessible. It is failing across the board for every single thing that you can fail when it comes to color contrast. So. Um, it says right now that it's the ratio is 2.58. I believe the ratio is supposed to be 4.5. I can't remember if that's the exact number then, but it's basically that. You can go through, you can click and see the different things that are in place for these various things. So I started digging into this, um, and I actually ended up some talking to a bunch of people here about the actual issue that I'd released. I know there was a PR that someone had tried to submit but it was changing a bunch of colors in the um, brand palette. And so people were nervous about that because it's changing like the basic feelings of Wagtail. But at the same time, when I look at what we're doing the CFPB and I look at what our color contrast things are right now for our site that we have, based on like a page that has 50 different um, page like page items on it so it's all that many different links we're coming back with every single page having 370 different contrast errors that's something where it's like if you're trying to get your software out so people can actually really use it go ahead and let's take a look at how to fix it so over the course of this morning i went through and i was looking at the wagtail style guide went ahead and installed that app and um, i will note i am a ux designer um used to be a front-end developer, I don't really develop now at all. So this is the first time I touched anything Python at all in 2018. I guess I'm here at Wagtail, so I have to touch a little bit of Python in order to install the app into my settings. Um, went and explored that, um, talked with some people on Slack. Um, thank you to Tim and Tom for being very helpful and giving me some insight into the reasons why um, I should be considering various things as I'm looking at the PR. Thank you also to the other folks who are working with me on the accessibility group, um, Rachel and Naomi, and also Kat and Scott for this as well. And we started going through, and I'm gonna see if I can load right now. You can see that right now it says that of all these things, there are 
19 different errors that are basically coming up on this page. I'm going to disable that. I'm going to go to my terminal, which again, I can't see very well. And I'm going to switch to the uh, branch I had where I've gone through and submitted a bunch of new things in order to make some slight changes. And I'll redo the run server to pull this back up. I'll do a refresh. So this is the way the site currently looks right now if you ever pull up anything in Wagtail 2.1. And did it not, let me do a hard refresh. These are the suggested changes that I've gone through to the site. Um, still feels like Wagtail then, we think. It's still using the brand colors and various things like that. Um, it's just going a little bit darker and increasing the font sizes on some of them a little bit in order to try and bring it um, into greater compliance. And now when you run it, the contrast errors have gone down. You don't have any errors at all now in this top section, which is the, really the section that I was focused on for a PR that I put up. And that PR is up right now. So you can go through and you can see it. I went through and kind of explained what was going on, like the numbers that I was trying to go for and the reasons why I was changing it. And basically just staying within the colors that already were in the palette. You just like shift it a little bit darker. I did have to end up going even darker at one point because there just it, there wasn't any colors that were left in the palette in there. And I also changed one line to be large enough to count as large text so that we could still keep it within our same color scheme there. So uh, thanks again to everyone who's been very helpful. This has been a fantastic conference for this. And this is my first contribution to Wagtail. So now it's up. Thank you.